Hi, it's Erkan here. Um, so we're at uh, Team Hards HQ. Um, and the reason I'm here today is because we're actually going to run an interview with some of the people that are involved in a high performance team. I don't think you can think of any more high performance than competitive car racing. Uh, and that's done within the Volkswagen Cup. And our driver, Simon Rudd, has been competing in this uh, series for two years. And um, I've been coaching him for the last year. And uh, we put this video together to really kind of start to um, show people how high performance teams um, operate and what's involved and how many different aspects there are into producing breakthrough results. I had the privilege of working with Simon and his father, Phil Rudd, and um, we brought them in on an interview that you're going to see in a moment, along with the sponsors and the team boss, Tony Gillam. So watch the video, see what you think, and pick out the key elements that make a team able to produce breakthrough results. We're over at Team Hard's Head HQ, as you know. Uh, Tony, thanks for making it. Yeah, fine. So, so how has your afternoon been? What have you been doing? Uh, we've been at a touring car team owners meeting today regarding next season, the future, how it's all going to unfold and basically what we've got to do over the winter to comply with all the plans we've got. So, uh, and that's British Touring Car? That's, that's British Touring Car, that was today. Um, always drags on a little bit, they love to have a lunch break right in the middle of everything. They had a so. lunch break, who gets time for lunch? Yeah. I, thought lunch I thought lunch is for wimps. We wanted to get it done and get back, obviously this was far more important to be here, so we got back as quick as we could. What's opening up is there's a lot more to run in a team, a high performing team, than just any one element, and it's a, a real jigsaw. Now obviously you probably have maybe the bird's eye view of all those elements coming together as team boss. Um, so how would you describe, what, what is it that you're aiming to provide drivers and sponsors as a team owner? Um, to to summarise, it'd be the complete package, the complete experience, because it's, like we were talking earlier about, a race weekend consists of testing, qualifying, racing. But when you talk about just track time on its own, if you have two 20-minute races and a 20-minute qualifying, you're there for what takes two to three days in preparation and then three days on the race weekend, you've got an hour of track time. There's obviously testing on top, but for that hour, you need to retain everybody's interest, everybody's attention to detail is critical in making it a complete experience for the driver, the sponsor, the family, the friends that are there. Because if you're only interested in what's going on on track and you have no interaction or any experience in between, it becomes a very drawn out weekend. So a complete package is essential on and off track. And that's something that really does, uh, I would say, set Team Hard aside uh, at the weekends and it shows. Um, just go and rewind a bit, how did you, I know you, uh, you used to be a BMX champion, I mean tell us a bit about that, I mean, so obviously performing and pushing your limits has been part of you for a very long time. We, from we've the beginning. been competitive from a very young age, we started BMX racing at four years old and we was British, European, world champion by the time we was ten, so it's, we Always wanted so I was to about win. to say you're good at pedalling, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah no, we did, we did I've got a little bit of power in the leg. So <laughs> okay. it, it's about a competitive edge, which, which you need as a driver if you want to win. Um, anybody could be a racing driver, and I say anybody because there's always a series you can race in, but not everybody can be a winner. Right. Everybody wants to be a winner, but it's how much time, effort and natural ability you can put into one giant pot and how many ingredients you've got to make the final package work. And then what would you say, what were your key learnings from the BMX days? Because obviously from an age of four to ten, these are really formative times and you make certain decisions about the way the world works. And I, I imagine some of those are still play a big part in... They are. I was, I would train every single day of the week, even as a kid of that age. My dad would spend a lot of time with me and it was having my family support and their drive as well, because you can't do it on your own. Nobody can do anything on their own as good as you can with, with the support. So we, we put the time in. I wanted to be the best, and I had to put everything into it to make sure that happened. If I come second, that was never good enough. Really? Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that is the right attitude, but that was my outlook on it. If I ever come second, the, not saying I'm a bad loser, but the bike would be thrown down, I'd storm <laughs> off and... I just wanted. wanted so do you, to do you need a bit of prima donna in a champion? Do you need to be kind of? You 100%. can't. You cannot settle for anything less than winning. No, I mean to, to win it. You've got there's different levels of winning. There's the individual race winners, which we've got a couple of. But what you're looking for is a championship winner. Championship winners have almost all of the pace, but they have consistency and they have the knowledge and experience to get a result when the going is tough. 
So championship winners are very different to race winners. Right. So it's it's no good winning three races and having four DNFs. You need to be finishing races and racking up the points. That's the, the secret to winning a championship it, outright, um, which is what we try and try and work on, but it's it's difficult to find that balance. Mm. And then so uh, so after the BMX stuff, what came next? So BMX was going to go motocross, but my cousin had a very bad accident, so that was frowned upon. So that, that didn't happen. So we sort of threw ourselves into education and football at that time. So we wanted to get some qualification under our belt. And then... Can I, can I just stop you? You keep saying we. I, I, so what I'm getting at is, is your family, your, yeah. your the people around you are always a key part yeah. in, in supporting what looks like a loan effort you know like yeah, when no, players playing football being on a bike there's all these other people around you to support you it, for me family is everything so that is my immediate family but then what we're building today is one giant family so family. i will never talk about i or me it's always we or our mm. and that's just what i've trained been... into myself because i feel that collectively we have so much more to give than what i could ever achieve on, on my own I, I could never achieve half of what we've done without the people around me and my family have been there from day one and anything I've done I've had the support and yes I've had the drive myself but that's no good on its own so you need the support so I'll always say we because it's always been more than just me on my own and I saw I sorry, so the football and then yeah football so we was quite successful at football we got up to semi-pro yeah. and I was working at the same time with the with family business and we was working long hours and training and boxing there was all, all sorts we, we was going through um, and then I was on a couple of scholarships. We ran our own one today, but I learnt by going on other scholarships from the old Fast Track Scholarship in 1999, when I first got behind the wheel of a racing car. And based on what the feedback was from the instructors was that I should pursue a career in, in motorsport. So that's essentially what we... What and we how did that start? Do. Was that karts or where did you... Didn't ever do karting. It was uh, originally in 1999, we did a few races in a single seater, which was called Formula Honda or Formula 600 at the time, which right. was a single-seater car with a 600cc motorbike engine. You know, when did it turn into this? I mean, it must have been a, was there a pivotal time, a pivotal plan where you said, I'm on a, you know, you'd have to be crazy, right, to say I want to set up a racing yeah. team, wouldn't you? You'd have to, there's got to be some kind of insanity in some ways, because it's so unreasonable thing to do. It is, and that didn't come immediately. What, what happened at first was, we went into the first race weekend and we had some success. We was on pole and we managed to win and we, we kept going. I just was living one race to the next and we, we managed to win the championship in the first year. So it was like, well, oh. this will roll into year two. So we're going to do something different. And then that was when we did the first year 2006 mm. VW Cup. And then we had a pretty much almost a season ending accident in the first race of the year we got wiped out wow. and we didn't have any money to continue so we thought that that was it um, but we managed to pick up a couple of sponsors but to get them sponsors we had to do things very differently to everybody else and that was the first lesson of how sponsorship doesn't really exist but what does exist is partnerships and an experience where people get value for money vw cup 2007 we did it with a big collection of partners that was working with us and we all had the same goal and that was to go and win against all odds. It's not about just handing over a bag of cash, it's, it's exactly what you're saying, it's about partnerships, it's about getting people together, getting their buy-in and everyone plays a, a role in that, in that uh, endeavour, it doesn't just happen by that. It doesn't, there's, there's so much that goes on off track and when I first sat down with Simon, which is very close to two years ago now, we set our stall out we had a we discussed a three year three year plan and what we signed signed with and we both committed to something which we was going to start the journey together we've sort we've, we've sort of hit our markers that we set out for ourselves we are on schedule but it's, it's very unpredictable along the way but we, we found a way together and i wouldn't have had simon racing for me if i didn't help simon and Simon wouldn't be raised. It swings both ways. So obviously his dad, his mum, Steve, the sponsors, we, we all have to work together to make it happen. So it's that mutual mutual alignment. Yeah. We, well, we, we learned that from trying to do it on our own. And I did go down the route and I, I have raced for a few big teams over the years of AAA and Redline Racing. And we spent three years in Porsche and two years in Touring Car. And it's what we learned along the way, I'm now feeding down to 
our team, our drivers, and it's, it's the only way that we can see the future in motorsport because there is no such thing as a paid drive anymore. It's not a professional sport where you get a wage for going racing. If you want to go racing, you either have to pay for it yourself or you have to offer more than anybody else can to attract the people to help you along your journey. Right. So, and that's what we're trying to build. We are essentially a working business hub and our show is racing. Okay, and what about times when you felt like quitting? Because what, um, what, one of the things I see about you is this resilience, this kind of, it's almost like you hit the wall and then you go, and you hit it again, <laughs> and then you yeah. hit it again until the wall goes, all right, so it up. <laughs> Well, every time we hit a wall, one of the bricks come loose. So for me, that still gives me... That gives you like... Th there's going to be movement there. Right, so then okay. you keep hitting that wall and you eventually you get through it. So and, and what gets you... What, what, you know, that, that, that sounds quite mechanical, but imagine on the, soft, the softer side of it, when you're laying in bed at two in the morning, you know, we, we all kind of... When you're pushing your limits, you sit there worrying or considering different options. What, what are the f common themes that keep you going? Basically, I'm now responsible for my drivers, my sponsor. I have, I, yes, I sit at the top of the tree, so to speak, but I have a commitment, a responsibility to everybody that sits in the same team. Now, that includes my mum, who's in the office with me every day of the week, my staff, the full-time staff, the weekend warriors, my drivers, their friends, their family, their sponsors. So if I falter in any way, the whole thing... So it's like a crumbles. responsibility you, 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 you've taken on. Uh, and an accountability to, to deliver on, on what you've set up yeah. for people. See, we, we, sometimes I'm guilty of promising a little bit too much, but if I do do that in any way, then I have to find a way of making that happen because I never want to let anybody down. And that is the thing. I have the drive and determination myself, but I also have, because we're creating this family, I would never, ever want to let my family down. And that, that's how I, okay. how I see it. And um, in terms of Simon, uh, would you, you know, he had a, if, you know, not only Simon, but Team Hard finished on a massive high, uh, end of end of Volkswagen Cup. Yeah. Um, obviously, you had your races in British Huge Touring. Hire. Yeah, I mean, what was that like? I mean, co uh, considering the season before, uh, compared to what you pulled out of the bag and how you finished first, second, third, fourth, fifth, yeah. and a record finish for Simon. Um, M massive, massive achievement, and it just shows what twelve months can do of hard work. We're now completely on our own. We have no outside investors or influences. It's, we're, we are 100% self-contained for the first time. Last year at Donington, just 12 months ago, we was lucky to get the cars finished across the line. We have a big reliability problem and it really did handle what we was doing. Testament to the team, but also to Simon and Phil, and putting the package together and the trust in us to come back, give us another shot at giving them what we believe we can give them. And to end the season how we did with a as you say, top five lockout. It yeah, was um, yeah. a massive, massive achievement. So it goes from top right through the team. So I'm hanging off the wall, cheering. There's a video doing the rounds which shows my passion for it. But then there's the tears from Simon's point of view which just shows how much it means to him, then his mum, his dad, my mum in tears. So that just shows what it means to everybody. Now, because we've all got the same goal, when we achieve success, we all do it together which is which is the best part of it all and a very proud moment for me to see our boys cross the line in that position and then what it means to everybody around so when they was doing the podium the big cheers and everything but then you stand back and you have sort of an out-of-body experience and see everybody looking up at our boys on the podium yep, with the silver yep. and that and that makes everything worthwhile yeah no that's a very special moment for everybody now i was uh, you know especially seeing simon you know, getting up on the podium. Um, and, when, and how have you noticed the changes in Simon this year? Because we've been, I don't know what you've noticed, because we've, we've not discussed this, but been working with Simon for about, since the beginning, before the season, till the end of the season. Um, I think the coaching, the conversations, we've discussed it a bit in the video earlier about, you know, just a view of how you frame your reality and how you can, you know, jig it so it actually is empowering you rather than disempowering. And that's the kind of things we've been talking yeah. about. Um, you know, however they came about, what changes have you seen in him? year without without making him cry again <laughs> no, I, I mean for me this year has been a massive learning curve for us all but mainly Simon's ability as a driver he's always had the natural ability but it's he's been his approach and when his approach has changed for the better his results have come for the better so just to, to give you to give you an example so Simon 
looks into detail at everything, which you need to do, and needs, like any of us does, the one-on-one -on -one attention. Now, the biggest turning point in the year for me with Simon, we went on a track walk together, and I think that was... I learned the most about Simon, spending that time with him on track, and as funny as it sounds, we gave him a small amount of homework to do overnight, and he came back a different person. Mm. Um, ever, ever since then, his approach has been different, but his application has, has turned a corner. And we see that in the last race, and the best thing that could have ever happened to Simon in the last race is that 100% pace, he deserved that podium, led from the start. There was a little incident behind him, it gave him a little break, but what that did, that gave him the self-belief in an instant, that you know what, I'm here, I deserve that. He led the race for 22 minutes, 21 minutes. He was quick enough to win it again at, at the end, which I think that's how we've got to start next year. But it was to have that self Believe and deliver that performance lap after lap after lap and it's the best I've ever seen him drive. It was a really mature drive I mean, that's what I was sort of commenting is it looked very composed. Yeah. he didn't look flustered and what, what would you say about the bit about because um, uh, Epps caught up with him to either tussle with him or let him go What would have been your because I thought he did exactly the right thing But the, what, the biggest thing for me was the body language of the car. Yeah, so the lines remained constant I could see where the gear changes were. I could see the head movements in what he's doing. So I, I look at everything in so much detail. Mm. I knew that he had it under control, and it was. He didn't want to fight Markle and ruin his own race. He sat there, but then it was the realization that happened four or five laps after he was down in P2 was actually. You know, you I know, could probably. You know what? I can. I could do this. I could. Yeah. I could win this. Yeah. And when he started lights on and showing his nose and everything, that was. Uh, a massive proud moment for me to see that happen mm. and the big the biggest thing that came out of it was we didn't change the car between race one and race two and ra race one the body language in the car was slightly different and the car wasn't doing everything that Simon wanted to do but it shows that you need to work together with your car in that he drove that race perfectly and the car did everything that he wanted to and more, not saying that the car was, was perfect, but once you get in tune with, with that car, if there is anything that's slightly wrong, because they're never 100%, no, no. you learn to drive around it. And by composing himself and almost taking a step back whilst he's racing, it was, it was just it such was a it. controlled drive. Yeah. It, was, yeah. it, it was perfect, really. Right. Um, like my metaphor is oil in the wheels. Yeah. It's like, so it's about, it's about clearing out the things that get in the way of performance rather than adding something. People think well, I'm always adding, but I'm actually usually pulling out yeah. things. That, you know, that's not, that's not serving you. That's, not, that's getting in the way, that's getting in the way. And then suddenly you've got some raw... That, that's exactly what we're doing now. So Simon's now reached the level as a driver where we don't need to trawl through hours of footage. We'll scale it down now and we'll just say, okay, well, you find your quickest lap and that's what we want to do. That's what we want to repeat. This is where that, the last couple of attempts are. And let's just look at that single lap performance, which... Once you get it right, and the difference between a winning driver and a driver that's really a top 10 driver is hitting the same piece of tarmac lap after lap so after lap. So that consistency and that discipline. That, okay. that is everything, which is why now we're able to focus on much more single lap performance. And once you've got that right, then you've got to do that every lap. Every lap. So and it's about getting, it, getting, it, getting the magic recipe and then replay, re duplicating it. Magic ingredients. Magic ingredients, exactly. Food panda. That's it, that exactly. Was point, wasn't that's it. it. Can you tell us a bit about the car? So, uh, the cars... <laughs> he said he goes, he's got wheels and it's like yeah. an engine and a turbo as well. They start life as a Mark V Golf GTI road car, completely stock. And then what we do, we use... The only thing that, re that remains from the road car is the shell, 60% of the wiring loom, the steering column, the steering rack, the front and rear subframes. Apart from that, everything else is race so we've got a, a split between road race car and then everything gets bolted on so they get the cage that's in they get debracketed so we want to get as much weight out as possible whether they're three or five door they run the same roll cage we have different suspension diff brakes brake lines exhaust the engine is a stock engine but obviously they are tuned to make 260 horsepower 400 newton meters of torque for as much of the rev range as possible. So it's making the most reliable car you can to again help that driver repeat their performance lap after lap, 
get that consistency, but at peak performance rather than just a single lap. So I've got a question. If we doubled the budget, let's say we could get another, you know, double the budget off uh, Steve, and he says, yeah, you go, and we've got to double the budget, would it make a big difference to the performance of the car? Or are we kind of, is the, is, the, is the series set up so big budgets don't win races? There is an advantage to having a bigger budget. When you're, if I was to say, if we had much more budget to work with, we could find another 1%. Now, in terms of percentages, that's low. But when you go to a track that's a, a short lap, they say it's a Brands or... 100 second lap. So they say it's Brands Hatch GP, 1 minute 40, you're on pole. 1 minute 41, you're 20th. That's 1%. So if you're 1% off the pace, first 20th. Is I know so, where so, I'd so, rather yeah, be. Yeah. So that budget can find that 1%. Now that 1% would allow us to do more testing. We would have newer access to new tyres in testing, more brake pads, more, more seat time. So, so it's the usable, the wearable stuff is probably the stuff that you could have it, more of. And yeah, the lifing of parts. So we, now we treat this almost like a touring car operation now, and we do life our parts because even though they are... When they, you say life our parts, that means what? You keep track of how long a part's been in, or is yeah, that what it is? Or? And, and we thoroughly check the cars a lot more than we're used to. So for hub failures and drive shafts and oil and fuel to changes, it, gearbox oil changes, there, there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. And the reason why we've got this reliability is because we've upped our game as a team and we've been able to pass that on and give the driver what they need to go and win okay. races. And on that note, uh, Simon, how far could he go? Simon could go all the way as long as, when I say all the way, he could get into a touring car and do a job. But what, what we need to do is do it the right way, where he can have the right amount of seat time to build up the confidence. Simon's not the type of driver that will get into anything, go out and drive it quickly out of the box. It doesn't mean to say he hasn't got the ability or the potential to be as quick as anybody else, but what he does need is a little bit more time. There's been an ongoing joke over the last two years where a lot of the times in race, his last lap of the last race of the weekend this is, the best one. is his fastest lap, which again backs up that can do it because he's doing that time when the tyres are past their best, the engine temp, the oil temp, everything's up. So well, everything's working against you and you've produced... Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so there's something in the mindset there that's kind of maybe just um, springing out last minute rather than... It's the, it's the initial... It's not being uptight. It's, it's, it's learning how to drive on the edge and put all that concentration, all that energy into what you need without distraction, without getting uptight and tensing up. Because as soon as you tighten up, your reaction slow down. Everything kind of gets a bit yeah, more... Right. Exactly that. Okay, uh, Simon, uh, anything else you want to add to our conversation? Anything, anything uh, you want no, to say, think, team boss? <laughs> no, I think... <laughs> so he's told us about the car, you know. We don't yeah, 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 no, thanks for that, save me. Yeah. No, um, I think like, like I just said earlier in, uh, in our piece was that See, we went on this journey like two years ago. Um, we, we were sat in your front room, weren't we? The and kitchen. We, the kitchen, sorry. Mm. To sort of not knowing you know, where it could go or whatever, and we're sort of sitting here today looking at, already looking at next year. So, proves how far we've come. There's been points where we thought we weren't going to get complete the season or, or anything like that, but um, I think like Tony's quite, you know, he's a positive guy, so. No, there's always, we'll always make it. There's always, than, a, way. There's there's always, always a, way. a way, yeah. So, um, um, Phil, for you, anything to sum up? Yeah, really, it's just great to be part of the team, I think. You know, Tony's, as you've seen, is a great um, um, motivator. Um, and, you know, when times are tough, he's always there banging, banging the wall, as you say. You know? Yeah, so, headbutting it. I'm going to use that, Tony, if you don't mind. I hope it's not copywritten every time you're at a wall. No, no, no. no. <laughs> We're going to be using that. Yeah. Um, but. No, it's just a, a, a great thing, and I have seen the change in Simon over the last year, and uh, Tony has, and, and, and hopefully the sponsors have as well, yeah. and here's to 2016. Yeah. yeah. Steve, so you excited about 2016? Bring it on. Bring it on. <laughs> I think Simon's finished on a positive. The whole team seems really positive. I think I'm going to get more of that next season, you know, go to a lot more races and be a bit more involved. And uh, yeah, really looking forward to it now. Okay, well, Steve, Phil. Simon, Tony, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for taking and giving us your premises to video from. So you can see there's a lot involved um, and everyone's got a view of it. And I think where 
when the magic happens it's something that we all really love to be part of so just take what there is to see in this interview and, and, and apply it to what you're dealing with whether it's business whether it's personal uh, I want to thank you for viewing and thank you for everyone for being part of the interview So you've just seen a great interview with uh, different people involved in Simon Rudd's uh, Volkswagen Championship campaign. Everything from Tony Gillam, our team boss, to Simon's dad, Phil Rudd, who's involved with gathering sponsorship and supporting Simon throughout the season. Also, the critical point of sponsorship and raising the money that puts this rubber on the road. I've really enjoyed the interview and I think there's a lot of really interesting lessons to be learned from what it takes to make it happen. I think for me, resilience is the key word. It's just keep going, keep going, and keeping the end in mind. I want to thank everybody for their involvement. I want to thank uh, David for videoing this, and everybody that was involved in the interview and, uh, and their generosity in sharing what has made um, uh, Simon's Volkswagen Championship campaign so interesting last year and got him onto, onto the podium and finishing second in the last race of the year. So thank you everyone and uh, I hope you enjoyed the video.